My name is Jane Hogan and I'm from Hogan Cider in England. We've been in business about 11 years. It started as a hobby for me and then slowly developed into a business. We're in the centre of England, in Warwickshire. In a small village called Hazler, population of about 200 people. We're seven miles west of Stratford-upon-Avon. It's a quite a lot of history, a very beautiful county. The village is very old. I mean, there's mentions of it in the Doomsday Book, which is 1066. So uh, it goes back a long way. At Hogan Cider, we produce hard cider using cider apples only. And cider apples are very different to eating apples. They typically have a very high tannin content. In fact, they're not very edible. We use a mixture of varieties. There's bitter sweets, bitter sharps. Now, the largest area of cider apple growing is in the county of Herefordshire. We actually press the cider fruit, cider apples, in the Malvern Hills, which is about 30 miles west, and it's the heart of cider apple and peri pear growing country. That was very important to us, access to the raw material. A lot of people say, oh, you're, you're a brewer. Where's your brewery? We're not a brewer. Brewer implies heat. We make cider, just as a winemaker will make wine. The process is dead simple, and it's been done for, for many centuries, if not millennia. We pick them around about October, November. They're later than the eating apple in England. We then wash it and sort it. We don't want any rotten apples in the blend. We'll then mill it, and that means breaking it up into a really fine uh, constituency, almost like porridge. And it's at that point you can start pumping it around. Up, up, up until then, you've had to move the apples mechanically or with water. Um, but once it's pulped, it takes on this liquid-like quality, which allows you to pump it into a press. We have two presses that we use. One has about five tons capacity, the other has 11 tons capacity. The press will extract about 75% by weight of the amount of uh, uh, apple that you put in there. One ton of of cider apples will produce about 750 litres of apple juice with a very high sugar content. Once it's pressed, we take it from there and pump it into tanks. We'll then add a yeast and the fermentation process will, will begin. We're totally dependent on the ambient temperature. If it's very, very cold, the fermentation process may not kick off for several weeks. If it's warm, the fermentation could be over in a matter of 10 days. We don't control the temperature of the fermentation. We literally rely on Mother Nature to turn the sugar into alcohol by way of the yeast. Once the fermentation is over, we will then rack off, a term typically heard in the wine industry. We'll take the cider out of the tank, wash all the lees or the, the yeast, dead yeast cells, remove those, sterilize the tank, and then pump, pump the cider back in. Remember, it has a relatively high alcohol content at this point, probably about seven or eight percent. It also has the appropriate acidity. That acidity and um, alcohol means it's an extraordinarily safe drink. Very little harmful bacteria, in fact no harmful bacteria, can live in that environment of 7% alcohol and a pH of about 3.8. So, uh, and in fact the legislation 
Uh, I'm not sure what it's like in the rest of the world, but certainly in England, we're able to produce a cider and package it and not put a best before date on it. Reason being, um, it's regarded as a perfectly safe product which will not spoil. Just like a wine, you wouldn't put a best before date on a wine or a bottle of whiskey um, for the same reason. The period following racking off might be six or nine months and what we're looking for there is a change in the cider. So we will typically see a malolactic fermentation happening during that maturation period. The malic acid turning into lactic acid. And during that process, the cider becomes much more rounded, uh, more complex, more mature. Prior to that, it tastes very, very young and rather harsh. So we need this malolactic fermentation, which can last for maybe six months, to round off the rough edges of the cider. From that point, we can blend them in different ways to get the, you know, the cider that we want with the right balance of acidity and alcohol. The cider industry is relatively staid. Very little uh, inventiveness, frankly. And I think what's happened recently is the stimulation of the craft beer movement where we're seeing enormous amount of innovation both in terms of styles and techniques. And the cider industry has been rather behind the curve when it comes to that. So what we've tried to do is adopt some of the inventiveness that the brewers have shown and applying it to our business. So while we make our cider traditionally without any concentrates you know, in the fermentation, we then try and do different things with it afterwards. We have one called Killer Sharp, where we use Brettanomyces yeast in the fermentation. Typically, we will use a champagne yeast. Here, we've decided to deviate from that and use a Brett yeast. We now have a really soured cider, which is very, very attractive, very Moorish, and very distinctive. Another one is a French style cider. We now do a keeved fermentation. Keeving, very interesting process typically used in France, in Normandy and Brittany, less so in England. What we're doing there is we will halt the fermentation early by starving the yeast of nutrient. And we leave the residual sweetness of the cider apples there. We've adopted the process and we think we've produced something quite unique. We have another one where we blend it with an infusion of English-grown Cascade hops. That's our hip-hop cider. And another one called Wild Elder, where we've uh, picked elderflowers in June and we've made an infusion, so like a cordial of elderflower, and we blend that with our cider. We also use peri pears to make peri. Again, that's like a, a bit like a cider apple. You wouldn't want to eat a peri pear, but it makes a very delicate drink. And it's the drink that the English noble people drank when they were at war with France and they couldn't get wine. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a different, delicate drink. One other uh, approach we've taken, which very few of our sister companies in, in the industry do, is that we've decided to do a cider apple brandy. What we've done there is we've worked with one of our uh, partners who distributes our cider, and that's a brewer called Adnams. They decided five or six years ago to invest in a distillation plant next to their brewery, and they're making gin, they're making vodkas, they're making whiskies. We know them very well and we were sitting down one day and our thoughts turned to how we might exploit their distillation capability and what we've done is distilled our cider which we then put into oak barrels and left there for three years and then bottled the product.
One thing that's happened in recent years with our business is that we're seeing a growth in the export market. We're putting that down to a real interest and a real concern about the provenance of products that are, or drinks that are available worldwide. And we're seeing an awful lot of interest from overseas markets. In fact, our biggest territory, overseas territory at the moment, is Russia. We're selling to Northern Europe, Finland, Norway, Lithuania, Estonia. Um, we're also, through Shelton, selling uh, into the US as well. But what characterizes all of these opp opportunities are a desire by the discerning drinker to try something with some provenance and some authority. Um, bear in mind, the UK is the largest consumer of cider and also the largest producer of cider. So we should have some good knowledge within the industry about how to make a proper cider. And I think a lot of countries are taking that on board and coming to us to source, source cider to be able to offer to, to their public. Mm -hmm.